Hey guys, Dr. Hampton here. Welcome to my channel. I'm here with Dr. Nicholas Norwitz, and Dr. Nick was my guest on Protecting Your Nest podcast episode 53. And of course, there will be a link in the show notes so you can check that out if you'd like. Dr. Nick and I have been having some discussion about lean mass hyper responders. And I thought, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe there are some folk out here who are not familiar with that term. So I thought to myself, how about bringing someone to my channel to explain that term and why you should care about it? So Dr. Nick, tell us a little bit about lean mass hyper responders. Um, and thanks, Dr. Hampton. This is one of my favorite topics, not only because I, I fit into this cohort, but it's, um, it's, it's one of those concepts that's coming up that just I see as potentially revolutionizing how we understand um, lipidology, things like cholesterol and cardiovascular disease. So um, I'm going to just define the term very simply here because this could easily be a 12-hour discussion and I might not even be the best person to, to talk about it. But for those who are interested, there's a lot, a lot of information on Dave Feldman's cholesterol code. Uh, about this topic and, and lectures about it to kind of explain his model around it. But basically speaking, a, a hyper responder in this context is someone who goes on a low carb diet and has their LDL cholesterol, which is typically referred to as the quote bad cholesterol, go really high. And what I want to point out, even before we get into lean mass hyper responders, is this is a minority response. Because I hear a lot of people kind of promote the concept, the myth, really, that um, a, a low-carb diet is going to increase your LDL, and that's going to be bad for your heart health. In most people, especially people who are overweight and have weight to lose, LDL does not go up on a low-carb diet. I want to clarify that. Also, overall cardiovascular risk markers improve in most people, including people who have LDL bumps. So HDL, good, triglyc good cholesterol improves, triglycerides go down, which is very good. Insulin resistance goes down, which is one of the best things you can do for cardiovascular disease. So the topic of whether or not low carb is good for your heart is another topic, but I want to clarify most people's LDL does not increase. About 20 to 30% of people have LDL increases on a low carb diet, and some of those have really high LDL increases, and those are hyper responders. Now, the term lean mass hyper responder comes from the fact that um, a lot of those people um, who have really big jumps in LDL, kind of the most exaggerated group, are typically pretty lean and athletic. It's a pretty reproducible phenomenon, um, quite honestly. It hasn't been demonstrated in clinical trials just because we haven't gotten there yet, but I would hazard a guess, and this is, is speculation admittedly, but like I could, or Dave Feldman could, go to a gym, for example, like pick out people we see working out that are like lean and athletic, lots of muscle, very little body fat, and put them on a low carb diet and get their LDL to jump and pick out other people whose LDL wouldn't jump. Um, so, so, so that's the physical phenotype. Now, what actually defines a lean mass hyper responder is three things. There's the low carb triad is having high LDL. So LDL levels above 200 milligrams per deciliter, which as you know, as a physician is pretty high. Um, but the interesting thing about that is, is it's coupled with really high HDL, good um, cholesterol and really low triglycerides. So I want to distinguish that. And this is the most important thing for understanding lean mass hyper responders. I want to distinguish that triad those three things, and it's important to look at them together from the triad of what's called atherogenic dyslipidemia, which is when you have high LDL, but then your good cholesterol, HDL is low and your triglycerides are high. So let me just make that clear and reiterate that. In atherogenic dyslipidemia, which is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease and something I would be very worried about and includes high LDL is high LDL, high triglycerides, and low HDL. But in the lean mass hyper responder context, that is flipped. You still have high LDL, but the HDL is now high and the triglycerides are extremely low, like very, very low. These people can be having 300 grams of fat a day and the fat in their blood can be like negligible, like 30 to 50 milligrams per deciliter, which is very, very low. So 
Um, the thing about the lean mass hyperresponders is that that triad distinguishes them from really any population that's been studied in the clinical literature. So for example, you know, when you take populations of people and put them on lipid lowering medications like statins, uh, Zetia, PCS9 inhibitors, whatever, you know, those effects are in that context. Not to say that they're not real, they are, um, but they're in that context. Even when you do, because um, there's lots of arguments to be made for, say, lipid lowering medications and their use, or the relationship between LDL particles, or say ApoB, and cardiovascular disease, everything that we know, to the best of my knowledge, is limited by the fact that they, it, it really doesn't apply to this really weird unicorn population. So if we look at like the animal data, that's different because of, well, one, the diets they're given and how they're genetically manipulated. But even, um, you know, the human, not genetic models, genetic conditions, familial um, hypercholesterolemia. So that's a condition that, you know, affects, I think, heterozygous one in like 500, but homozygous FH is a one in one million condition. But some of these lean mass hyperresponders are getting LDL levels that high. And there's a lot of them. It's like um, I, Dave Feldman did a poll on Facebook the other day where he was asking, you know, what people's cholesterol levels were. And provided people weren't lying, in a little while, we registered like 40 plus people, or he did, with LDLs at homozygous FH levels, which would be like, what, 15% of the entire population of homozygous FH. And plus, we test some of these people. Um, or have, and they're not homozygous FH. This is diet induced, and that's the weird thing. And I'll tell you, as a, as as a, someone who is one of these people, when I've gone to cardiologists, and I love talking to cardiologists, even conventionally minded ones, because I want to get every opinion. I'm really curious about this, and I'm not flipping about my high LDL at all. Most of them like say I, I've never seen this before. My LDL is gone as 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 a, it was, you know, baseline before I went low carb ninety, so quite low, just genetically, it's gone up to close to 600. And I can manipulate it with diet manipulations like on the spot. And it has nothing to do with like the amount of cholesterol on my diet. In fact, when I reduced the cholesterol on my diet, six fold from 1800 milligrams to 300, my LDL actually just went up a little bit along with the decrease in my HDL. So that wasn't great. But like we do all these, it's, it's, it's a fascinating and um, it may have to do with an adaptive response. So the fact that these people are lean, now I'm going to tie in the lean part, is if they have high energy demands and they're lean and they're not taking in carbs and they're dependent on fat, what can happen is your liver can be trafficking fat um, carried in the LDL particles, which when they drop off their fat, basically become LDL particles. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but then the, the LDL basically is hold over from this fast fat trafficking, they tend not to actually degrade into the atherogenic small dense LDL. So that's another thing, there's big fluffy healthy LDL, and then there's the small dense. And when you have this phenomenon of a lean mass hyperresponder, here's the interesting thing. The LDL does increase, it goes up a lot, but generally the small does not. So not all LDL goes up together. In fact, I did a case report on um, a lean mass hyperresponder whose LDL was quite low. It over tripled when they went low carb, um, but the small dense LDL went down by about 10%, despite the tripling of the LDL. So, um, and there were other changes in this person and, and other people consistent with this adaptive response. Now, here's the question. In this population, are they actually at significantly elevated risk of atherosclerosis. And what I want to make very clear here, because I think I'm misunderstood, and especially Dave is misunderstood, by saying that, oh, we can shrug this off. If you're a lean mass hyperresponder, LDL is high, we don't care. We don't know that. But it's the fact we don't know that, that we really want to question. It's like, because, you know, the case by case, patient by patient, treatment of say hypercholesterolemia it's it's complicated they're a pro and cons list and it's not as easy as just saying i can snap my fingers or just take a medication and without any side effects or any downsides or any risks the ldl will go down so it's important to not throw the baby out with the bathwater, in my opinion and we can go into it if you want this would be a much longer video but 
basically whenever you're treating a person, you want to come up with a pro list and a con list for the benefits of a treatment and the downsides of a treatment. And there's a lot of levers to pull, but because of this phenomenon, there are a lot of people who are keto or low carb who, you know, these pros and cons lists end up being question marks. And then it's like, what the heck do you do? Um, for some people coming off ketogenic diets is not an option. For some people, some of these medications, in fact, all of them might not be options. And so it becomes a really difficult, difficult calculus. And so I think what we're really excited about it, what I'm really excited about is not just how this phenotype and us studying it can inform our understanding of what's going on in the body with lipids, which is just fascinating academically, but also inform the best clinical practice. And if that actually means in the end taking a statin, then fine, so be it. I just want to see the data. I'm not on a statin right now personally, but you know, I don't think, I think sometimes we're, we're painted with a, the cholesterol is an airbrush and, uh, and that's not it at all. I'm just really curious be perfectly honest. And this is something that I think there's a huge blind spot to. It's funny when I go in and, and have doctors tell me like, well, well, that's weird. Like I've never seen this. And then I walk out without a prescription and we're all just kind of confused. Had good discussion, but more or less, I think we're all kind of confused and nobody really still believes that this is like a really prevalent and reproducible phenomenon. And I promise you it's everywhere. People, especially clinicians just aren't seeing it. And that's what's yeah. exciting. It's just like a blind spot that yeah. I'll just tell you, because we're spending a lot of time doing this now, a domino chain is set up. And I think the finger is kind of like hovering over the first domino. We'll see over the next five years. Um, but but you can quote me on that in five years. <laughs> and I, I but I love how you 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 really are answering the questions I would have had. So I appreciate your framing and you really have to, people have to understand that um, being a scientist as you are, uh, I think we're all scientists in healthcare in general. We have to uh, be skept skeptic and we have to constantly ask questions, constantly be comfortable not knowing all the answers. And even a well, well informed person like yourself is not getting to the answer necessarily, but it does allow us to have conversations with our clinician. Mm -hmm. And it does give us permission to consider the possibility that we don't have to treat everything a certain way or always have to take medicine. And that's what's, so when, when we talk to patients and we say to them, have a conversation with your doctor, it could be something like a PSA for your prostate. You don't have to do the test, just talk about it, or, you know, weigh, pros and cons, and make a decision. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, most clinicians are probably not as familiar with this scenario. So you may have to find a doc who's more metabolically familiar. You may decide, you know what, I'm going to, this is one set of data, and let's look at all the other metabolic markers I can look at. Maybe I'll get a coronary artery calcium score scan. Maybe yeah. I'll get an apolipoprotein B. Maybe I'll mm -hmm. do a, you know, a, a C-peptide. Maybe I'll do a fasting insulin. And if you come to the conclusion that there's more data to support me not taking medicine and just working working with this and, mm -hmm. and then protect my nest by doing all the things I preach about, exercise, yeah. less stress, more sleep, I think that there's a path to making a decision you can live with. Yeah. There's no right or wrong answers, which is what I'm hearing from you. Absolutely. I think it's it's a highly individual and um, you know, maybe we can record something another time about the practical things LMHRs or even just other hyperresponders can do. Um, the levers they can pull, like you know, shifting to a diet higher in unsaturated fats or right. including fiber if that's an option. It's not an option for everybody or even you know, um, we're looking at some, some, some case series data now shifting from a ketogenic diet to a low carb diet, including just 50 ish grams of carbs a day. In one person had dropped their LDL. This is 50 grams of carbs a day, 50 to hundred. So still a very low carb diet dropped LDL. I'm saying dropped 480 milligrams per deciliter. That's like 10 statins on top of each other. And so like there are options and, and, and a lot of people might, might want to make that trade right now. It might be for that person, the conservative thing to do for other people. It might not be an option. Say somebody's epileptic and they need to be in therapeutic ketosis or otherwise. So I just want to open up these conversations and give people permission to have them because I think there's still, 
a taboo on that. And it's, it's a difficult line to walk. I do not pretend to be doing it, uh, doing it well, but I try my best. No, I, I love how you do things. And I really appreciate you just coming aboard to share your thoughts. So I want to thank you, Dr. Nick. And, uh, and I want everybody who's watching to understand that myself, Dr. Nick, we're on a mission to inspire and educate you. So make sure to check out Dr. Nick's uh, YouTube channel as well. I definitely will have a link to that in the uh, show notes. And if you didn't know, he also co-authored a cookbook, a cookbook called the New Mediterranean Diet Cookbook, and I'll have a link to that as well. So I think that we all know a little bit more about lean mass hyper uh, responders, and I hope this information adds value to your life. So make sure to check out the future videos because I'll continue to have experts like Dr. Nick on. And, and of course, make sure to like and subscribe to my channel. So guys, until we meet again, be safe, be well, and continue to protect your nest. Thanks a lot, Dr. Nick. Thank you.